Welcome to this week's edition of Freedom and Prosperity Radio, the weekly radio news magazine created by the Virginia Institute for Public Policy and put together at our website, tertiumquids.org. Thank you for taking some time out with us and joining us in this week. I hope you have uh, had a good week, and we are ready to go with a very interesting program, beginning with House Joint Resolution 34. It's a constitutional amendment making its way through the Virginia General Assembly. And to uh, begin the discussion about it and to dig into it a little bit, uh, for us this week uh, is uh, from Virginia Wright, Sandy Sanders, and uh, VARight.com, if you do not already follow the website, you should. Sandy, welcome to Freedom and Prosperity Radio. How are you doing, sir? I'm doing fine. I thank you for the honor and the opportunity to speak to the people who regularly listen to Freedom and Prosperity Radio. Hopefully, I won't hurt the ratings too well, much. This no, week. you could never. Believe me, uh, you're 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 making us six inches taller and a better dancer just for the work you do. First and foremost, let, let us thank you. Uh, we we don't often have uh, folks who write for varight.com on. Uh, uh, it's often just scheduling things, but uh, you do cr- terrific work, and we often uh, work off of uh, reference to uh, things that uh, are brought up there, and uh, we work all together on the uh, point of view that. Uh, if the Virginia General Assembly is hearing from its constituents, then uh, all things being said, that generally they will at very least come up with no movement, which is better and sometimes than the uh, hardcore statist movement, and especially now with the Virginia General Assembly just very precariously teetering on the side of the Republicans. But uh, in the last few years, we've seen how questionable sometimes their judgment even can be. Um, we are very concerned yes, about this. We, we, we agree with that. So uh, let's let's talk about uh, the uh, House Joint Resolution 34. It's a constitutional amendment that would provide Virginians a check on the state go- government through direct democratic process known as initiative, referendum, and recall. Uh, and bring this uh, talk about this because for years it's always puzzled many people. You'll hear recall stories in other states uh, that Virginia really doesn't have a mechanism for recalling a public official. Explain HJR 34. Yes. Delegate Sam Rasul from Roanoke has introduced House Joint Resolution 34, which is a proposed constitutional amendment. It is largely based upon Article 3, Section 1 of the North Dakota Constitution, and I will take a little pride in some of the authorship of it, that because I looked around to see, uh, spoke briefly and looked around and tried to find a bill, and some of the states, like Ohio, have very, and have very elaborate constitutional legislation I did not think Virginia legislators would be interested, would be turned off by elaborate rules. So what I tried to do was was give the General Assembly a greater hand in coming up with the electoral procedure once provided that they pass it. But the basis for House Joint Resolution 34 is that if the citizens of Virginia get 4% of the vote in signatures on valid petitioning in a particular period of time that they can place a law on the ballot, and then it gets voted on, yay or nay. Four mm-hmm. percent, I think, based upon the last election, is about 100,000 signatures, which is a, an enormous number. It is not an, it is, I meant it to be a little bit difficult. It shouldn't be something that's easily done. But on the other hand, I also thought it would be a better selling point. I certainly think that there are opportunities to amend that. You can amend that to three or two and a half. People choose to do so during the electoral process. It takes five. Per, it would take five percent to do a a referendum. Mm-hmm. Referendum is when a bill has been passed and people don't like it, or people want to vote on it. And so a group would get five percent of the signatures that automatically go on the ballot, and it would either be yes or no. Do you want this law to continue or not? That we, we want to do these things because it's a check and balance on mm-hmm. the legislature. There are certain issues that legislators simply aren't going to touch. A good example is term limits. Every state that uh, I understand, every state that has had term limits enacted has enacted it through initiative and referendum. Now, if you'll mm-hmm. pardon me to give a little bit of history. Sure. Initiative and referendum was, is not in the Constitution. It wasn't started until 18, 
1896, South Dakota was the first state. And it has been more predominant in the West than in the East, although the last state to initiate initiative and referendum is Mississippi in 1992. There has not been a state since then that has done that. A lot of legislators are opposed to it. I spoke to a legislator, and he didn't like that idea. And uh, there also spoke to some. I spoke to a conservative, very very staunch conservative, who I know is a very dear activist, and she, she was afraid Soros is going to come in and use the initiative referendum to take over. My view would be is that I think you need that check and balance. I think the legislators need to feel like that if they do something, they pull a bonehead thing. They ought to be challenged by the people. Mm -hmm. And I also think that getting those signatures automatically starts the issue is going to be discussed, it's going to be debated in the media, people are going to talk about it as they get the signatures, and even if the effort fails, you still have brought the issue out in the open and there are legislators who are going to say, you know what, a bunch of people did did go out there and they did work hard on it. Maybe that's a potential issue. Challengers can use it for primaries and general elections and say, I think I want to run on that and use that as an issue. There are some exceptions sometimes. I did not put exceptions in here, but some states do have exceptions for taxing and spending and those kinds of of specific appropriations and those kinds of things. I left that out of the bill. Mm. Now, the interesting thing about how constitutional amendments are done in Virginia is that you need two votes of the legislature with an intervening election. Right. Right. Justice Frankfurter was once quoted as saying, before you interpret the statute, it is helpful to read it first. (laughs) So I decided to go back and read Article 12, Section 1, which is the provision of state constitutions that calls for constitutional amendments. And I read it very carefully. I'm a lawyer, so... uh, And I read it very carefully. I haven't gone to the interpretation to see if a court has interpreted Article 12, Section 1. It does not say anything about consecutive sessions of the legislature. In other words, if it passes this session and then it passes two sessions from now, right. it will go before the voters as a referendum. Now, initially, when I talked to Delgate Rasul, I was very honest with him about it. I said, look, I don't even know if this is the right year to do this, but you could at least get it out there and have people talk about it. Well, it's, said, it's that always would accomplish, been... That would accomplish something even if next year was the big vote. Well, once you get it out, and that's always seems to be the convenient time is the year right before the Senate and House elections, uh, that one time every four years where they coincide. Uh, there are right. all these constitutional amendments all come out in that year because they're trying to do right. it efficiently. Uh, but, yeah, I, it's, and, and, there's and the nothing. election that we talk about is an election to the House of Delegates. If the House of Delegates are up for election, that's the intervening election. It doesn't have to be a gubernatorial election. It certainly isn't a presidential. Well, uh, uh, just uh, I think it says both houses have all the 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 House and Senate both have to have stood for re-election. That's why it's every four years they do it. I, I I just remember going through this with the property rights constitutional amendment. That it uh, it had to be all the seats, the House and the Senate. Oh, okay. Yeah, uh, but but that uh, no, happens well, every that four wasn't years. How I, how I read it, but on the other hand, I have I don't have it in front of me to okay. look at well, right so, right so, this moment. But I do know that this year counts. Yeah. If it passes this year, it counts, and the governor can't mm-hmm. veto it or anything. This is strictly a legislative mm-hmm. issue. And it would then go to the ballot once it passes the next time. It would come to us. With the intervening um, you know, election to, intervening, yeah. that's correct. Sandy Sanders from uh, VA Wright. Uh, talk about the years that have come since then. You mentioned some of the Dakotas, uh, Mississippi. What has been the fruit of doing this? What is the history that we're, we're looking at in these other states where they've put this petition, this right of petition, if you yeah. would, into the Constitution of these states? A lot of referenda deal with, well, of course, the term limits I've already mentioned. Marijuana has come up on the ballot. Now, not every, not all of our listeners are going to are, are going to agree, and I'm not taking sides in, in that matter today. I'm simply saying that 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 the issue of medical marijuana or mm-hmm. the issue of legalizing, as was done in Colorado, was done by initiative. As a matter of fact, that's the only way it's been done. Vermont is about to pass. I think they. I think legalizing marijuana in Vermont, and 
they are trying to do it through the legislative process rather than initiative and referendum. They don't really have initiative and referendum in Vermont. I think they put certain things on the ballot. The legislature can put things on the ballot, that kind of thing. Right. Educational issues have been have been brought up. Casino and other gambling is one of, one of the sources of proliferation of gambling. Uh, casino gambling and lotteries have have the, the lottery was enacted in Virginia through a refer, through a constitutional amendment because the constitution had to be changed in order to allow uh, in order to allow lottery. Perhaps mm-hmm. the most famous initiative of all is Howard Jarvis's Proposition 13, which is still the law in California, as I understand it, mm-hmm. and that started a nationwide movement about tax reform, about spending. Yeah. It's, it's that is still the reverberating reason. to this day, and it wouldn't have happened if the the legislature of California would never have passed a bill like that. Yeah, uh, but uh, the you, people you, did. Now you mentioned education, and one of the great frustrations on this program has been the inability to get real reform. Uh, it was warned that when Virginia did its uh, "quote unquote" education choice. Um, uh, scholarship fund, you know, contributions, et cetera, et cetera. Right. The, the danger was that the General Assembly would then answer any question about future school choice amendments as we've already dealt with that. And that has been proven out that every time you bring it up, oh, no, we did school choice. We did. There's this scholarship fund that if the state decides you qualify for it, you can get a little something uh, and it's all given to us by our, our corporate friends and they get a tax break, whatever. It's not real school choice. It's just a state-run you know, slush fund, uh, scholarship fund. Uh, and so, so you mentioned school choice, or you mentioned education. Do you think we could, uh, uh, you know, as a point of order, say, go out and get four percent of the ballot, uh, the the signatures, and force them to discuss a, a real school choice voucher program here? Sure, we can. There's no limitation in this constitutional amendment on what issues can be can be raised, and I think it is. I think it would be good for the grassroots. I think. I think that initiative and referendum could even help Republican Party win statewide elections. First off, they should embrace it. They should embrace the people making decisions. Mm-hmm. Now, I agree with the Tea Party lady that I talked with about they're going to come in and spend a bunch of money and they're going to put, like, gun control and stuff like that on the ballot. So we have to have our powder dry as conservatives and libertarians all the time. Sure. But we need that right to put stuff on the ballot as well. And if we put stuff on the ballot and we're able to get these signature situations, get enough signatures, because you're going to have to have, if you need 100,000, you're going to need 125,000, maybe 150,000 to be assured that you got 100,000 registered voters. If you have that kind of a grassroots effort where people are collecting signatures for things like this, you're going to have a powerful organization It is true that money is a very powerful predictor of politics, but it is not a perfect predictor. Ask uh, ask, uh, Speaker Cantor. um, Exactly. But but also there was something that I read in my preparation that talked about there there was an initiative where where the people were outvoted six to one and it still was victorious. So money is not the best predictor of politics. A good example of that might be the attempt to put right to work in the state constitution. It was defeated, and it's defeated 52 to 48, and I was quite surprised it was defeated. But my, my wife happens to have been a bus driver for Hanover County Schools years ago, and so she got, she got a, a, a flyer from a group that was opposed to it, and I'm sure the unions and the, the education people mm-hmm. were behind were behind this to defeat this amendment, and they had came up with an interesting, and it was all it was all based upon materials that are technically true, but a little bit I, I say misleading in, in context. But they managed to cause enough of an issue, and it's not like they spend a bunch of money to get it out. They just quietly got it out yep. to teachers, bus drivers, and people like that quietly use that as their grassroots to say, you know, we don't want to muck up the Constitution with useless amendments, and it already is the law of the land. And then they talked about some of the reasons that right to work, I personally very strongly believe in right to work. But I would encourage my union friends that are listening to this radio to contact their leaders and say, get behind this bill. You might want to put right to work on the ballot. And I think 
I think if right to work gets on the ballot, it should be debated. Mm-hmm. It should be thoroughly debated. Well, yeah, absolutely. And Sandy, so so what about something like redistricting, which has been a, a political football? Uh, many of my friends uh, claim that mm-hmm. you know the intractability of the general assembly is because of uh, the uh, the supposed uh, gerrymandering uh, that I think was somewhat it's not supposed. Uh, it is. Well, they, you know, when, uh, I brought up the uh, 14, uh, 14 losses. A lot, but let me say this. Arizona passed the redistricting commission that was, I'm not necessarily endorsing a redistricting commission, but Arizona passed a redistricting commission that was upheld by the Supreme Court because the Constitution apparently has some kind of a clause that basically says the legislature shall redistrict. And what the Arizona voters did is they essentially – delegated it to this nonpartisan redistricting commission, and some of the legislators said this violates the federal constitution, went to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court said, no, they can do it like that. It doesn't violate the text of the federal constitution. I'm sure, I haven't researched it, but I'm sure that was an initiative that was put on the ballot by people. And mm-hmm. yes, we could have. Now, I think redistricting commissions can have the, 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 the drawback, if you would, of bringing in issue of of the people feeling like they don't have really any say. Sure. They don't have much say as it is now. So I don't know that that would be an improvement or not an improvement. But the answer to that question is yes. Umbrella groups can get together and they can talk about they can talk about different issues like that. We can have you can have redistricting reform. There can be other ideas. There's an idea Del, Del, I believe it's Delgate Rasul has introduced a constitutional amendment that would allow for, and there may be others that have done it too, uh, in essence, you when you voted in an election and there's more than two people running, you would vote first choice, second choice, third choice. Okay, okay. And Waited, if no one yeah. gets 50% of the first choice, then they go to the second choice votes until somebody gets 50%. When somebody gets 50%, they're the winner. I don't know if I'm for that either, although I do say in – I do say in strong defense of Delegate Rasul, he, he's an idealist. He's in government for the right reasons. He's very liberal. I disagree with him on some issues very strongly. But he's in politics for the right reasons, and he's trying to open up the system and make it work for people. And well, if it works for people, it can work for conservative and libertarian people as well as for well, and you're, you're right. And, and, and Sandy, I think this gains strength from the ideological differences of those who are uh, talking about it. Sandy, uh, let me ask you this. Uh, the part of it we haven't discussed yet is the recall part of mm-hmm. this, uh, because we've seen this on local levels. We've seen this uh, several times in central Virginia where uh, citizens have said, well, hold it. This guy is you know, not what we expected. Can we get rid of him? And the answer is outside of a fel- felony. Yeah. You're right. So, so what's uh, take us into the recall part of your proposition and uh, Delegate Rasul's proposition? Well, it simply says that the legislature shall establish a recall system, and it, and and I would say that if this constitutional amendment passes, the the present recall system is going to have to be amended to make it better. The present recall system requires some kind of malfeasance in office. For example, there is a recall pending right now. It's at the Supreme Court where the Clerk of Court of Montgomery County allegedly fired several senior people, Mm -hmm. allegedly because they didn't support her in the election and those kinds of things. So they got a a, a, a civic activist, someone like me, got a petition together, got enough signatures on the ballot, got enough signatures in the petition, then submitted it with a petition asking the judge to have a hearing. And that's what has to happen if everything works out. It got sidetracked on an issue of whether each individual petitioner had to be sworn at the time, which we I don't believe no. that's accurate. But the judge made that ruling. The circuit court judge made that ruling. They brought a circuit court judge from another part of the state, and he made that ruling. And then it went to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court has granted appeal, and they're going to hear the case. So they're going to decide whether... Yeah, they, they always has dangerous to... to predict what a Supreme Court's going to yeah, do, but well, I think the Supreme Court's going to overturn it and send it back, and I think there's eventually going to be a trial. But again, the people don't get to decide the recall. The judge does. 
Right. And it's so not my view is, is that what we need is we need a recall. Should it be easy to recall somebody? No, it should not. It should be very difficult. But very difficult and impossible, two totally different things. And we need a check and balance on, I know of a county where there's an activist and they want to get rid of one of the supervisors because the supervisor basically basically ran on one set of promises and said some things and then has yeah, now no, turned on yeah. them yep. and is now on the opposite side. And so they would love to try to recall because now, now it's a four-year term and you've got two years left maybe in a four-year term mm-hmm. where things can get done and, and, and maybe the people's will has been thwarted. So the recall mechanism is very cumbersome in Virginia. I don't know where it came from. I don't know if it was a bird, if it was from the 1902 Constitution, which we know is, was a terrible Constitution. It was the 92 Virginia Constitution was, was the Constitution that basically disenfranchised many of the African Americans and set up a lot of, of, of the more formal Jim Crow situations. And that Constitution has been Re, yeah, it's, it's extensively revised in yeah. 1972. Yep. Well, let me let me ask you this, and you know, now if I'm reading this correctly, you've done some research polling on this, um, or the is it the citizens well, I in charge? Have, but Paul Jacob has commissioned. Paul Jacob runs a a group. It's uh, citizens in charge, if I remember the name correctly. Yes, he's up in Woodbridge. If you if you Google. Paul Jacob, an initiative referendum, and I got a lot of my stuff from Paul. He helped me with the talking points today, and so I want to make sure that I thank him. All right. yep. And Paul Jacob says that in every state, even in Hawaii, where it was the least likely to, it still got like 57%. And if I recall the statistics for, for Virginia, it was 72% of the people favor some kind of initiative and referendum, some kind of an opportunity to have their say through mm-hmm. the ballot box. So, they, they, so Virginians, when asked, would uh, would support this idea as well. Yes, I don't know the details. I don't know the margin of error of the poll, but to me, it's consistent with my common sense approach. I think people, I think people liked it when there's constitutional amendments on the ballot. They talk about. It. I know the lottery was a very hotly contested, and both sides had good arguments to make, and I think the people enjoyed the chance to decide the question. And I think it's important for the people to decide the question because legislators can get kind of in a, in a, kind of in a sealed box, a little bit of an ivory tower mm-hmm. where they think, and they're good people, and I think most legis and, and I am thankful, by the way, that we have a citizen legislature. I am thankful that our legislature only meets for like the two months or three months out of the year unless there's a special session. Now, I know that legislators have a full-time job because they're constantly talking to people throughout the year and stuff. But you've got legislators like California and Michigan. Oh, they serve never... <laughs> almost the whole year, oh, and so yeah. they're kind of insulated from the process. And I don't want people to be insulated from the process, but I think, it is, I think it's always possible to think, well, you know, the people send us up here, we know a little more, we, we, we're dealing yeah. with the bills, we have AIDS. And I think it, it does tend to lead to that kind of thing. There's an institutional, I think there's an institutional arrogance. Say a swap yeah. In it. Yeah. Well, let me ask <laughs> you, you, you get, If you're not careful, you can get covered up by the swamp very quickly. Now, Sandy, where's the best place our listeners can find out more? I have Sam Rasool. It's sam4roanoke.com, the number four, sam4roanoke.com. But right. what, what about and, you? And, uh, I would go to. Um, the VA, if you right? want to know a lot about initiative referendum in general, go to Paul Jacobs' webpage. I, okay. have, I have cited the, at, if you go to Virginia Right uh, and you look up initiative and referendum or look up Rasul, you will find information about that bill. I'm helping him, by the way, with another bill, which is statewide indigent defense system. Okay. But um, maybe that'll be a future radio thing. Yeah. But uh, it's, uh, but it's, it is the, um, and I also want to say, but I, but Delegate S. Rasul at, and I think it's house.virginia.gov. I'm not. Oh yes, yes, that's how the the that's emails go. You can go. get yeah. a hold of his legislative aide, his name Lily. But I want to urge people to to support this, and I also want to say, an activist can really do something and can get something done. It takes. It takes time. You've got to get to know delegates. You've got to get to know senators. You've got to be upfront and honest with them. 
you've got to establish that you know what you're talking about. And But one individual can do something because I'm, I mean, compared to some of these other folks, I'm a nobody. I'm just a, I'm just a country lawyer out here at Mechanicsville. I work in the city. I help people with their briefs and stuff. So I'm just an ordinary person. But we can get things done, and we ought to get things done. And the political process is not just for the professional people. It is for ordinary people. And if we get initiative referendum, you're going to see a lot more ordinary people saying, let's get petitions together, let's get organizations, let's form an umbrella, and let's get this thing done. Sandy, thank you so much again. I appreciate it. Sandy Sanders uh, from VA Right, uh, activist working on this uh, House Joint Resolution 34 uh, initiative referendum and recall. Thank you so much for joining us this week on Freedom and Prosperity Radio. Next, joining us on Freedom and Prosperity Radio, uh, fresh from their annual lobby day on the Hill, but certainly not the only time they're going to hear from Philip Van Cleve and the Virginia Citizens Defense League uh, is uh, on with us. Philip, welcome back to Freedom and Prosperity Radio. How are you doing, sir? I'm doing good, sir. How are you doing, Joe? Excellent. So you guys had a pretty good day for a one-day visit to the Hill, but I guess it's measured more in terms of the fact there were an awful lot of things uh, of a fairly draconian nature already in the pipeline. Uh, so this year, it seemed like you, you, the the gun rights community was facing a lot more um, from the General Assembly than they have in years past. Is that a fair thing to say about this General Assembly? Yes, it is. Well, I think the Democrats uh, felt somehow that they they had to kind of an edge, so they threw everything at gun owners but the kitchen sink. And and you guys were certainly able to knock it off like uh, Andre Agassi at Wimbledon, uh, so that was good to see. <laughs> uh, it, 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 the first ones, of course, were uh, the David Toscano proposals and Cree Deeds proposals that would allow municipalities to arbitrarily and capriciously just decide guns were banned for whatever reason they met their whimsy. Uh, take us into that one. Certainly that revolves around the uh, Unite the Right versus Antifa uh, rally riots in Charlottesville of August of last year, despite the fact that only one firearm was even involved uh, in it. They seem to make that the the keynote of of the whole affair. Uh, Take us into that one and why that one was so concerning uh, to the VCDL. Well, yes. uh, And, you know, they, yeah, you completely, they completely forget that it was an automobile that that, that actually caused one death and 19 people to be injured. The, Mm-hmm. Um, the person that fired the gun shouldn't have fired that gun, but he was also the guy was uh, basically had a little miniature flamethrower going so uh, at him. So who's uh, also facing uh, charges? It was, it was our situation, but the bill, yeah, the bill would allow the lo- localities to ban guns in, in government buildings and, and the parks and pretty much anywhere they want. That takes us back to the bad old days. We've already been there. And uh, all that did was made a confusing mess that nobody really knew the laws in the local area they were. If you travel through the state, forget it. There was almost no way to know if you were in violation, if you carried in a park in Charlottesville, or if you open carried in, in some other locality, um, Chesapeake or whatever. So this, was, this, wasn't, this wouldn't have really solved anything. The, uh, you know, it, it, people intend on doing harm are going to do harm. And like I pointed out, uh, there were some bad beatings recorded on video. It oh, yeah. had nothing to do with guns, but you could be murdered at one of those things, being beat to death, and you'd have no way to defend yourself under this law. Well, and certainly one of the most uh, notable cases is the case of DeAndre Harris, uh, who has become a flashpoint in the local community, but isn't even from Charlottesville, and uh, began his affair by hitting somebody in the side of the head with a mag light, uh, one of those metal flashlights. So mm-hmm. uh, I don't see any bills regarding control of mag lights. No, and I had I did have fun with these bills. Uh, the, the, basically, they the, you know one of the bills said you know you can't have. You wouldn't be able to have a gun within a thousand feet of an event like a parade or a, a rally or, or a protest or whatever. And I said, to, I said to the committee, I said, you realize in about thirty minutes we're going to have a rally out in the bell tower area, just outside this building, and it's a permitted event. 
And that means that everybody in this building would have to disarm themselves uh, based upon this p- proposed law. <laughs> <laughs> you should see the deer in the headlight look of everybody up on the pi- up on the dais up there. You know, I said you guys included. <laughs> Well, and, and isn't that part of, you know, the, the yes, it's fun to have some fun with this, but this, the, this zeal for this really has left common sense waiting at the door, hasn't it? It does. You hate to see this because, as you say, it really isn't funny that, that they're trying to harm uh, our uh, one of our rights, take it away, strip it, restrict it. They're not really attacking any other right to this degree, even not even close. Mm-hmm. It's almost a hatred that they've got. Uh, a, a complete disrespect for the right of people to defend themselves. It's, it's, that part's mind-boggling and, and very disappointing. And, and uh, the, the, the Democrats voted for all of them. Uh, Deeds and, and uh, Edwards and, and all of them up there voted wrong virtually every time except one time. The one time they voted right was to let firefighters and EMS uh, carry a concealed gun with them uh, when they're on duty wherever they go, which which makes sense. If you had to, if they had to run to the school in an emergency, you know you don't want them to have to figure out what what am I going to do with my self defense gun. Uh, they need to be able to take it wherever they go to save, you know, because they'll need it with them uh, and so forth. So mm-hmm. that was it. Other than that, they they pretty much voted wrong on everything every time, and that's just that's just really disappointing. Because wrong in this case is taking away our rights. Talk about your uh, petitions to the committee and the, you know, now with this nearly 50-50 split in both the House and the Senate, it's very concerning because uh, all you need is one somewhat less than committed Republican uh, to break ranks. Luckily in Virginia, I think we still have enough uh, Second Amendment appreciating Democrats that that might be offset. But uh, talk about your presentation to the committee. You've been doing this a long time for the Virginia Citizens Defense League, Philip. Uh, What was their response? And did you sense that there was a real different energy in this General Assembly now? I really, you know, if I were just to have landed from Mars and dropped into that committee and not known about everything that's been going on since November, um, I don't know that I would have other than the, the number of, of anti-gun bills, which was the, the bizarre thing. But keep in mind, they duplicate, triplicate, they have quadruple copies of some bills. They just It's like you can't get enough of a really bad idea. <laughs> and uh, they, uh, other than that, though, the committee, uh, you know, the committee was up there. Logic and reason were coming at least out of part of that committee, and enough of it stuck together to... Uh, and so there's a good margin. Yeah, again, it was nine to six on most of the votes that, that not the bad yeah. bills. Um, and uh, so in the Senate side, things look like kind of like, except for the number of bills, it looked like pretty much uh, the same as, as it has been. Well, certainly, the, uh, I'll know uh, more when I see the House in action. Yeah. I haven't uh, haven't had any House bills yet come up. Well, and certainly the same old saw came out, uh, which was the universal background checks. And we go back to Katie Couric's famous uh, documentary, and I put that in air quotes. Uh, I'm sure you chuckled as well when the story floated quickly that she might replace Matt Lauer at the Today Show. I'm thinking, well, gosh, I'd rather have Matt Lauer tell me the news than Katie Couric. Um, (laughs) He might be getting something on the side, but at least he may be telling me the truth about the news. Um, but, But, you know, given the fact that it's, again, here here we are with universal background checks as opposed to the amount of background checks already gone through by uh, gun purchasers. Uh, that also came down uh, in Senate committee as well, didn't it, Philip? Yes, it did. And that was a big issue for the for the governor. He really, really was touting, you know, universal background checks. You know, we're going to do this. Mm-hmm. And uh, boy, it went down in flames in committee. That wasn't a, that wasn't a tight vote. Again, that was a nine to six down. She went. Um, and uh, I would uh, sort of think that that's the same that's going to happen in the in the House. I think hopefully universal background checks with DOA. Somebody brought something interesting about this. I've I, I mentioned before that uh, I don't know if I've mentioned on this show or not, but um, there's a, you know the Fifth Amendment kind of kicks into one type of gun control in an interesting way. If there were gun registration in Virginia where by law you had to register your guns or you could be charged with a criminal penalty, the Supreme Court has ruled that criminals would be exempt from having to register their guns. It would only be you and me. And that's of course, sounds like I'm making this up. But it's the Fifth Amendment. They say if you force a criminal to have to register a gun, you're forcing him to incriminate the, himself because he can't legally have that gun. That's the same logic. 
I don't know if it, I don't think it's been applied there, but it could be applied to sure. universal background check, saying, well, you know, criminals if they, if they get around it shouldn't be charged because you're forcing them to admit. Uh, to incriminate themselves by admitting that they shouldn't have these guns and going through this background check. And it's an interesting thing. We didn't we didn't present that kind of an argument, but uh, I think it's a, it's probably a valid one for the future. Now uh, you mentioned Philip Van Cleve is on with us, Virginia Citizens Defense League VCDL dot org. If you're not a member yet. Please. Uh, and of course, we're heard in the Lynchburg Roanoke area. And one of the newest members, one of the 14 uh, new members of the House of Delegates is Chris Hurst, the news anchor whose girlfriend was shot down brutally on TV at Smith Mountain Lake. Uh, although, you know, he certainly and I'd like your opinion on the amount of money spent on that particular race. Uh, I think it was uh, in excess of two million dollars to divvy up 2,100 votes. It was stunning the amount of money that came in in the gun lobbies uh, from that, Philip. Uh, but but beyond that, uh, it, yet nothing, it seems, in the General Assembly is coming forward regarding uh, reporting issues with employees or perhaps troubled employees that might need, uh, you know, some some psychological treatment, which really was the case that wound up blowing up at Smith Mountain Lake that morning. Yeah, it's the same. It's the same old, same old. They'll take whatever story it is. They'll disregard the real problem, where that you could find a true solution. Mm-hmm. They'll throw that away and they'll pick on guns. Uh, I, I think it's easier because a gun's an inanimate, inanimate object. They can't argue with you. It can't have hurt feelings and all that. Yeah. But boy, you know, when you start talking about having to figure out what to do about mental health, serious mental health issues, or or an employee that's disgruntled, and how do you how do you defuse something? That's a tough one. Nobody, they really don't want to touch that. They want to, they just want to play with the, the, what they consider the, the, the lower hanging fruit. Well, and certainly a gun doesn't have a mom and a dad and a sister who might vote for you or, or you know, a whole family that might wind up voting for you. Talk, talk about the, the amount of money in that Roanoke race with Chris Hurst. I mean, it's, a, it, it's stunning that you, you know, for two seats that pay minimal amounts of money until you start adding the per diems in and things like that. Uh, but, you know, for basically two part-time jobs, this race divvied up $2.1 million for like 2,100 votes, Philip. Uh, that's that shows to me the zeal at which you guys are trying to fight back against uh, the gun grabbers. Yeah, and, and, and the other side has one thing they've got. They, they don't have the kind of uh, people that we have that, that are the, the true deep believers that go out and truly vote the issue and all that. What they've got is Bloomberg, mm-hmm. and he's got lots of money and Soros, lots and billions of dollars. I mean, for them, a, a few million dollars is like us digging in our pockets and pulling out a quarter. Uh, it's not a big deal to them. They don't even blink an eye about a few million bucks. But that's what it is. But that, uh, especially Bloomberg, he's determined. He's determined to to turn us into a socialist society where people like him are the head of it. Yeah. You know, they're running the show. Uh, he wants to control soft drinks, everything else, and guns are a part of that. Uh, because you have to control guns to truly become a socialist society. Uh, you can't have people, free-thinking people, <laughs> able to defend themselves and everything. You know, you need to have everybody uh, following as a pack, uh, helpless, except for the, the, the benevolent government protecting right. them. It's, it's a sad situation. I can't believe we were even talking about this. When I was growing up in the, in the 50s and 60s, uh, we, we knew that socialism and communism were bad. Now, somehow, we're, we're, we're <laughs> we have people actually talking about that. I, I, why would you live here, then? Just move to a country that's already got it established, like Argentina. Uh, have fun, you know. Knock yourself yeah. out. They've already got the works in place. Venezuela is They're doing uh, doing great down in Venezuela. Join the food riots. <laughs> yeah. uh, we're starving to death. You know, we're, we're killing cows and fields because we're desperate. Yeah, right. Exactly. Uh, you know, so, so talk about that. We we watched Ralph Northam scare using a fear and loathing campaign. Three hundred thousand more votes out than ever cast before. Because if you go historically, uh, Ed Gillespie got more votes than Tim Kaine, Terry McAuliffe, Bob McDonnell uh, before. For them, and it's just that Ralph Northam's campaign scared so many people out into the voting places, uh, and certainly the firearms issue, the Second Amendment, is one of those that they use. Uh, are, are we still in tenuous times? I, I want people to join the VCDL because of your impact in Virginia uh, for it, but I, I I can't underscore the the fact that there's a real campaign afoot to scare people, uh, and I think they're going to use the Second Amendment issue over and over again to try to do more of it. 
Oh yeah, you know if you if you truly believe in your right to self defense, you need to join the CDL because this, these attacks are serious. Yes, we're able to beat them down, but we we're a very efficient you know organization. And but we need people. Um, you know, as we see from the elections, the elections go bad. Uh, now suddenly, you know, uh, you know, us trying to fight for rights, we're we're, we're going to be running on fewer cylinders because we don't have as many friends in the general assembly. Um, it's it's. Look, freedom is not free. We say yeah. that it's a cliche, but it's true. It's absolutely true. You have to you have to contribute to protecting your own freedom, and part of that is being part of an organization like this. Uh, there are other organizations for different causes, but sitting around and just thinking you can make a living and that's it, well, if you don't mind giving up your freedoms, that's fine. But truly, if you want to hand in America to your children and your children's children, that was what you had growing up and had the wonderful freedoms and liberties, you're going to have to get in the battle. You just have to do it because other people are in it, and they're not going to they're, they're going to keep going until they, they have stripped away your rights because they want to basically be able to control society. And that's not a joke. It's just the way it is. Now, I was told by folks who were there with you at uh, Lobby Day, they didn't see a lot of gun-grabbing protesters uh, counter-protesting the VCDL, which they were surprised at. Uh, is is that, again, what you were saying? You have very committed members where they have people who are sort of just doing it to be in the cool kids club, and if nobody sends out a Facebook post, nobody's going to show up? Well, that that could be definitely part of it. Uh, you know, historically, they it's been pretty unusual for them. It's been many, many, many years since any of them showed up to protest one of our rallies. Um, they don't show up at any of our meetings. Um, we, uh, you know, no, we don't, we really, you know, if, if it weren't for the fact that we see them at their protests, you know, and, and see them in the news and all that, just living in the world of going to VCDL meetings and VCDL events, you wouldn't know they existed. Right. It's, it's like Sasquatch. Uh, we have a sighting. <laughs> we have an anti-gun sighting. Uh, you know, the last uh, bill that we hit the Senate and went off into finance is this bump stock legislation. I just came back from the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas. They're still trying to scramble around. They are as tight-lipped about anything going on there as possible. There's been f- some leaks about cell phone investigations and things like that. Uh, but the, again, is this bump stock legislation um, a red herring in your view uh, as opposed to a mark? Caring, I guess, uh, Philip, regarding uh, 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 you know serious gun legislation. Uh, I know it went off to the Senate Finance Committee. This is another we we're, we got to do something. It doesn't matter if there's something does really does anything at all. It just got to that way. They say, oh, well, we we did something. You know, it's just, it's politics at its worst, and it's it's so typical. Um, again, we've had one occurrence. There are we've had bump stocks available for many, many, many years. Lots of them out there. We've had one occurrence, and honestly, if that guy had been taking his time and doing aim shots, uh, it would have been a lot more lethal than than using a bump fire up there. But I, I made a video up for the committee to look at. I, we, we emailed them links to it, uh, showing me bump firing a gun with just my bare hands. I didn't no other assistance. It's just a matter of going out to hold the gun. And uh, and you can bump fire it, uh, and I I bump fired one nicely with nothing. Then I had another video of a guy pulling the trigger as fast as he could next to a guy with a bump stock, and they fired uh, I forget ten twenty rounds, and it was a dead heat. Right. Um, so so it... I basically said, you know, this is not, you know, the, the law, the way the wording is, you know, you you can't have something that speeds up the gun faster than an unaided person. I said, well, I can go as fast as any bump stock, so. I'm the unaided person, so your bill's worthless. And, and, and um, you know, uh, right. you, you've got that. And, and just, uh, I don't know, it's, it, the whole thing uh, is crazy. And it moved forward to finance. Uh, so it's not dead. But finance is not a good place for a bill to be if it wants to survive generally. Okay, well, it's good news to hear from there as well. Um, Philip, uh, we, a couple of minutes left here. I want to get some events you have coming up, but uh, anything in the General Assembly, in the House of Delegates that you, uh, that's you that been pre-filed that's concerning we should be watching as well? Well, we, of course, we do have some good gun bills. Um, and, uh, and by the way, the, the Senate is not through with gun bills. They ran out of time on Monday, yesterday. So tomorrow afternoon, they're going to probably finish up most of the gun bills that are in the Senate. Uh, most of which are bad. Um, there, yeah, the number of bad bills uh, was like three times the number of good bills. They just went crazy with it. But um, 
I don't know that one of the again in the Senate kills some bills that are also in the House. The House has basically mirrored a lot of the bills that are in the Senate, and um, one of those that was a great concern was that somebody could just you know swear before a judge that oh you know uh, Joe Thomas is a, is a danger to himself and other people, and then they can issue a warrant to come take away all your guns without you even knowing anything happened. Oh, you hear a knock yeah. on the door, you open the door, and there's a guy, a police officer pointing a gun at you saying, I need to come get all your guns. And then two weeks later, then you can finally go to court and defend yourself uh, against what could be totally baloney. That bill died, but the House has got him as well. I mean, that's really dangerous stuff uh, that people could do to you out of sheer malice. Uh, it could even get you killed. You know, you open the door, somebody's pointing a gun at you. Oh, they gosh, could be in the middle yeah. of the night. You <laughs> might be holding a gun because you don't know who's out there. VCDL.org. Uh, Philip Van Cleve, thank you so much, sir. You have a great week, and thanks for joining us on Freedom and Prosperity Radio. Thank you, Joe. Appreciate it. And thank you for listening this week, and uh, we will continue to watch this uh, session of the Virginia General Assembly here at tertiumquids.org. Uh, and again, with all our friends like the VCDL. Until next week, so long, and thanks for all the fish.